Before acclaimed director Oliver Stone made poetic images of beauty plucked from realism, he first made two horror films. Hello everyone and welcome to Nocturnal Horrors. My name is Sean Mazeral. And one of these horror films might actually stand the test of time. Technically, it's not because it's a great film. It's more because of a Shout Factory's new Blu-ray release of The Hand than it being a film needed to be preserved. And then there's his first feature-length directorial debut known as Seizure. A film relegated to being found on YouTube or to be rented on VOD as opposed to a Blu-ray full of special behind-the-scenes videos, interviews, and a director's audio commentary. You see, some of our best directors of all time have a few films they want to forget. After all, even Stanley Kubrick tried to destroy his debut feature film, Fear and Desire. So when you watch these two films made by multiple Academy Award winner Oliver Stone, remember, we all gotta start somewhere. What would have happened to cinematic history if Stone gave up after delivering two horror movies that weren't quite up to par? We wouldn't have the likes of so many brilliant films that made us dive deep into our own moralistic psyches. Films that make us look at a country's histories from different points of views, whether it be the military, a lawyer, several presidents of the United States, leaders of other nations, rebels, or even the media. But before all of this, there was Stone's student film last year in Vietnam, which he showed to his film class, which was actually being taught by a young Marty Scorsese. And Scorsese, after seeing this short, declared, Now this is a filmmaker. But we're not here to talk about that movie. We're here to talk about Seizure and The Hand. But when a horror film comes out in 1974, there's only one thing we can do, and that is compare it to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Obviously. We compare, we judge, we examine, we critique, and while Seizure attempts to create fears through your typical jump scares, with startling inserts of sound design to no real effect, and images of bad guys the filmmakers think you won't expect, it just doesn't ring true. Not in the script, not in the decisions the characters make, not in the special effects, not in the direction. All the while in a hot, sticky setting in Texas, other villains were living their lives the only way they knew how. In a world so terrifying, audiences didn't know what the hell to do with themselves. Seizure stays in a world of horror tropes, dream sequences, and a bunch of bizarreness that doesn't ask us anything important. Instead, it asks us questions like, huh? Seizure is about a horror novelist, Edmund, who has a recurring nightmare about three dark, mysterious figures. Edmund and his family are having some friends over when these antagonists decide to no longer live in our writer's dreams. They decide to come out and play. Violently. One thing that's really interesting about Seizure is that its premise almost feels like a predecessor to Stephen King's The Dark Half. In Seizure, you have a horror novelist creating villains that come to life to create havoc. And in The Dark Half, published in 1989, you have a horror novelist whose pseudonym, George Stark, comes to life, creating havoc. But as we know, this same story can be told so many different ways, and they can go in so many different directions. Seizure unfolds slowly, showing the serenity of a well-off family in the country with leaves full of mesmerizing colors and a lake of peace and calm. It's a world so many of us strive for, but there are small chinks in the armor. The husband second guesses reality, the son worries that his father might harm him, and their little dog goes missing. And there's tension among the incoming guests. There's a gold digging wife, a young broke playboy, a brash millionaire who easily gives the best and most fun performance, as well as a woman who speaks to her dead ex-husband on the regular before going to bed. And then, well then, everything just kind of starts up. The villains appear, they put the characters through the ringer with odd competitions of cardio and strength. It makes little sense. But what's really strange to me is the fact that the horror novelist that has dreamt up these characters, the one who has literally drawn a picture of them all, he literally has no answers whatsoever. He dreamt them up. He should know who they are. He should be able to figure out a way to stop them. 
It doesn't mean he has to stop him, but he should have some idea of what to do. In the end, this is a film that does not have a long shelf life. And honestly, the only reason this film is even known about whatsoever is because it's Oliver Stone's directorial debut. But we can't all hit the ball out of the park on the first at bat, right? So, in this second film, does Oliver Stone grow? And how much does he grow? The world had to wait seven years before this film starring Michael Caine came out. But Oliver Stone had already won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for the 1978 film Midnight Express. So clearly, Oliver Stone must show great growth as a writer and filmmaker in the hand, right? Or is it only later on that he truly becomes the acclaimed Oliver Stone? The Hand is about a comic book creator who loses his hand in a freak car accident. Unable to draw anymore, his life begins to spiral dramatically as he attempts to piece his life back together. He's having problems with his marriage, adjusting to a new prosthetic limb, becoming a teacher, as well as keeping control of his pride and joy, his comic strip, Mandro. Based on the novel The Lizard's Tale by Mark Brandel, this film is played alarmingly straight for such a silly premise. You see, Michael Caine's character couldn't find the severed hand. The severed hand seems to have a mind of its own. It's an evil freaking hand. The film's pace is slow throughout, building its themes, its characters, and their obstacles. And you really expect it to ramp up to an insane level, and it never fully gets there. Besides the wackiness of a severed hand running around on its fingertips, the tone of the movie feels like a straight up drama as opposed to horror for a majority of the movie. And that's truly my biggest issue with this film. You can't have a premise this kooky without having a little bit of fun. There should be a little bit of camp in this. There's gotta be a little touch of camp. Just a bit of humor. <laughs> And while Michael Caine does eventually fall deep into madness based on the progression of his ridiculous hair being all out of whack, the movie overall takes itself way too seriously. You gotta loosen up, Oliver. Michael Caine does the best he can with the role. It's insane to see Caine go as far as he does. And you can also feel the sense of, I can't believe I'm actually acting in this film, from him. He has since deemed that he took the role because it was a paycheck and supposedly wanted to put some rooms over his garage and needed money. At least he's honest. So did Oliver Stone grow as a director from Seizure to The Hand? Of course he did. This was a studio film with a bigger budget, bigger actors, more locations, and a James Horner score. The writing, cinematography, and the overall direction was far superior to Seizure. We can talk more about Seizure and how it was made for under $200,000, or the fact that Stone was directing The Hand while doing drugs every day before going to set, or the constant fights between Stone wanting The Hand to be a psychological thriller of the subconscious versus the studio wanting it to be straight horror. We can discuss the fact that there were over 30 special effect hands created for the film. But I'm not saying this is a good movie. Far from it. If you're not an Oliver Stone fan or a Michael Caine fan, there's very little reason to see this film. But in the end, Siskel and Ebert probably wrap up the story the best. Well, my dog of the week is The Hand, a laughable horror film about a cartoonist, Michael Caine. Now, I know this is supposed to be a psychological thriller with The Hand as some kind of metaphor. <laughs> Supposedly, it follows Michael Caine from New England to Nevada. <laughs> it still makes me laugh. Do you think it signals its turn? <laughs> if you want to see the extreme growth from Oliver Stone, you'd have to wait another five years from 1981 to 1986 when his brilliant film Salvador appears with incredible performances from James Woods and John Savage, as well as Platoon, which came out the same year, a film that has definitely stood the test of time in performances, writing, direction, and theme. It's at that time, 1986, that we see director Oliver Stone shift from over-the-top silly premises in our beloved world of B-horror to diving deep into his own world, planting his films into stark political realities current affairs, foreign policies, war, and moments in history he's able to pluck from his own past. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, if you are a fan of The Hand, Shout Factory just put out the new Blu-ray. It looks great with special features. Also has an audio commentary from Oliver Stone himself. And if you want to dive deeper into Oliver Stone, his filmmaking, and his past, 
I highly recommend Chasing the Light, which is his memoir. I recommend that. I do not recommend these two horror films whatsoever. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.